Good evening and welcome back to Dell Technologies World. We are steaming through night one of three days of live coverage here on theCUBE. Very excited, the environment is buzzing. You can see all the people enjoying cocktails and this fabulous reception with the vendors behind us. My name's Savannah Peterson, joined by my co-host and the co-founder of theCUBE, Dave Vellante. Dave, thanks for having the time for me this evening. Oh hey, it's great Appreciate to be you with you. A few I'm psyched to geek out here. <laughs> I know, we get to really <laughs> geek out. This is going to be a good one. I'm super excited. Our next guest is John Rose, the Global Chief Technology Officer of Dell Technologies. And we are not only going to be talking about our AI future, but about AI and quantum, which makes this nerd very, very happy. John, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for making the time. Oh, always glad to be here. Yeah. It's a busy week for you. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is definitely a busy week. It's it's good week though. We have, uh, you know, a culmination of a lot of work around AI. And you know, maybe a year ago we thought this was going to be a big industry, and and now it's just the beginning of a very big cycle. But you can kind of see the buzz here. So, you absolutely can. So I was watching an interview you did for Dell Tech TV last year. This time last year, and and you were we were still even calling it at that time. You were saying the full word generative AI instead of Gen AI. Obviously a lot's changed in the last year. What's the biggest difference for you walking in this room tonight versus when you did last year? Well, I think the level of understanding of the AI ecosystem and what is possible has gone up dramatically. I mean, a year ago, I was talking to someone earlier today about this, the top topic that we talked about around risks of AI was hallucination. Now think about that, that's less than a year ago, we were all saying, oh, they hallucinate, these things really are going to give us bad right information. Right. No one's talking about that. It isn't that hallucination isn't a thing, it's just we've evolved to understand that you have tools like retrieval augmented generation, you have different model choices, you have the ability to manage the system in a different way that we all know an AI will be intrinsically slightly flawed or error prone, but we've gotten beyond that being a reason not to do it, and now we're building systems that accommodate the, the strengths and weaknesses of them. And so there's just a very rapid year-over-year -year maturation, even though we're still at the very beginning of kind of large enterprise adoption. Yeah, RAG is becoming trivial. Yes, <laughs> well, well here's, a, here's a statistic for you. I, I was thinking about when I learned about RAG, you know, really understood RAG. You know when it was? One year and one week ago. And wow. it was because, and I know the date because I was at RSA and I met a guy who founded a, a AI startup. He came out of Hugging Face and met a ran research there. And he explained to me the details of RAG. He's actually one of the guys on the original paper of RAG, which is only like three years old. And me and my head of research were listening to him and we had this great breakfast and we came back and said, that's it, we need to lean into that. And then we really pivoted hard to say, separating communication from data using RAG is the right architecture, at least at this phase, and the rest is history. But to think, that kind of came into our consciousness a year ago. That's it, right. Yeah. The adoption. Were you at RSA this year? Oh yeah. Yep. Okay, so last year it was all about bad guys using AI, yes. write better phishing emails, and then eventually the good guys. This year the whole conversation was, this stuff's dangerous, we have to, we have to secure the AI. Nobody was talking about that last year. No, no, their, <laughs> their biggest thing was, oh, we can use AI, but we better have a human in the loop yeah. in everything. And I kept telling them, I said, you know, in a race between a fully automated attack and a defender who's a human being in a chair with a couple of co-pilots, you're going to lose every time. That was, that was the dialogue last year. You're absolutely right, this year it was, nope, it's real, we got to figure out how to lean into this thing. It's now, it's now core. So in November, at the Dell Tech Summit, I think it was, I had asked you about AGI. Yes. And your answer kind of opened my eyes. You said, yeah, basically the technology's here. If you draw the curves, the exponential curves, everything's here that we will get to AGI. And that, that's like, wow, okay. So we started thinking about that, yep. digging into it a little bit. And then I just mentioned Elon the other day said, 99% of all intelligence is going to be bi non-biological within five years. I think it was in five years. Yep. He probably said next week, but you know. let's, let's make it 10 years, right? And to your point, it's, it's all there. Yeah. Uh, how scared should we be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I mean, hey look, there, there's never been a technology that was created and intrinsically was good or bad. It just is. 
technologies yeah. just do things. They're the manifestation of engineering tool. and they create a tool. Yeah. And so whether it's AGI or generative AI or machine learning or neural networks, they're just tools. It's how we use them and, and quite frankly, how we put them into practice that matter. And the one thing we can't control and I, you know, is, is you know, hey, a bad person can use a tool for a bad purpose. Okay, in the security industry, we know that's already happening. So what is the countermeasure to that? Try to keep the tool away from the bad people? Well, we should do some of that. But the real tool is use the technology and invent better tools or better ways to use it for good that counteract the bad. You know, it's always this pendulum. There's, there's two forces in play, things that are trending towards chaos and entropy and things that are order and goodness. And the reality is yes. we as the technology industry invent tools and then it's also our responsibility to get them into practice in ways that actually help humanity. And so the more we invest in making sure enterprises are building great AI systems that make their businesses run better and act in a more secure way, the more likely that some weird individual with an AI tool trying to mess up the world is unsuccessful. And, and so everybody plays a role in this balance. And for the most part, we have kept it over here on the good as side. As long as entropy doesn't yeah. win. We'll yes. Be, we'll be okay. I think for the most part, I, I do think that we are kind of at this really interesting momentum yeah. linchpin where when we talk about it with democratization and the mass adoption of things, there's a lot of different characters with stuff in their hands. Oh yeah, yeah. And a lot of different things can happen. I want to take it somewhere a little less nefarious for the next <laughs> few moments. Well, maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Maybe. Good luck on maybe. that. So I felt like when we were at Supercomputing 2022 in particular, the conversation around, this was just before ChatGPT came out, it, the conversation around AI and quantum were, were pretty equivalent. We were talking about both almost 50-50, I would say actually heavier handed on the quantum side. Since this surge and tidal wave of AI applications and agents and conversation, we really haven't talked about it at all. We were chatting, Dell's been doing a lot of work with quantum and AI, tell us about it. Okay. Well. Well, well, first of all, you know, both are incredibly relevant and both of them are going to mess up our world. Then now we can see AI <laughs> messing up our world. I mean, it, it moved our cheese, it changed our environment yes. in big ways. Quantum is very similar and, and it, in fact, you know, quantum mechanics already are touching all kinds of parts of our world around random number generators and, and material science and quantum encryption and post-quantum cryptography. But in the quantum yeah. computing space, one of the things that we asked as kind of a provocative statement was, how will quantum potentially impact the AI world? Because now everybody under, thinks they understand AI, we have this new computing paradigm coming that ultimately should do something to the giant application of compute, which is AI. And so, you know, initially when we, we threw that out there, nobody could really answer it. We all kind of knew about quantum machine learning, and we all, I mean, even the experts in the field said, I don't know exactly what it's going to happen, but we know these two things are very entangled and interrelated. Okay, over the last six months or so, a lot of us, myself, my team, lots of people in the industry have been trying to figure this out. And, and here, here's where we're at. The first is, it is inevitable that a probabilistic computer, i.e. a quantum system, would be incredibly valuable to a probabilistic system like a generative AI environment. And so mathematically, it just seems like they should fit together. Double click and ask, okay, well, what would happen if I had a reasonable scale quantum system and I could apply it to my current AI ecosystem? And a couple of things we don't know. I'm not sure it would help that much on inference because it's not really that kind of thing. Maybe it could, well, I won't rule it out. But when you look at training, it's fascinating because the result of training is to take a very large data set really that point. effectively represents a whole bunch of different paths and manifest it as a mathematical formula that then can sit inside of a neural network. Hmm, what do quantum systems do? They take an infinitely large set of permutations and they're able to kind of instantaneously calculate an answer, which the answer is the mathematical representation of what that data actually means. And so there's a lot of people, including myself, that think one of the big breakthroughs on quantum in the early days might not be necessarily inferencing or low level stuff. It might be that it just revolutionizes training. Now, think about what happens if that occurs. And it's still an if, but it could. One, the cost and complexity of training changes dramatically. It doesn't mean there isn't training infrastructure, it just means you can do it a lot faster and a lot more efficiently. That'll have a profound impact on the overall building of foundation models. But the other thing that's intriguing, if you go far enough out, is if suddenly the cost to train is relatively low and the amount of compute is smaller, 
then an enterprise might actually entertain building more original models. Today they don't do it because it's not cost effective. It doesn't make sense to them. That, and so, you know, we'll see what happens, but it could actually really change the model ecosystem dramatically. Now it's going to require reasonably large scale systems. The second observation that's really the more fascinating yeah. one is this relationship between quantum and AI. What I just described is how quantum helps AI. But like every good technologist, one thing you learn is always look at something from 360 degrees. So flip it around and ask the question, does AI help quantum? And the answer is absolutely. And in fact, the early breakthroughs are in that direction. The first, most quantum systems have very hard kind of containment field problems and control system problems. It turns out AI is really good at helping you build more effective, higher performance control systems and things that can manage a magnetic field. And so some of the really hard physical layer problems in quantum will actually only be solvable by the application of AI and that's happening. And then the second order effect is if you've ever tried to program a quantum computer, most people haven't, it's kind of like building assembly language. But you actually build kind of logical circuits that represent the math you want. That is incredibly difficult to do. And so there's a lot of work going on saying, what if we apply generative AI, and what if the user experience to program a quantum computer is talking to it? It's like the equivalent of going from assembly and skipping <laughs> object-oriented programming and Java and Go and all of these going directly to human language. <laughs> and that's actually happening right now, Pretty mind which says, yeah. what if we democratize <laughs> quantum just like we've done AI? From load A story to just do it. Yeah, to just <laughs> yeah. do it. I want an algorithm that does X. Let the AI system do it in a better way. And that, that completely changes the learning curve and the adoption curve. And so one of the things that we've concluded is, look, the this is velocity. not a one-way relationship, and in fact, the interesting virtuous circle is we need quantum to dramatically improve the efficiency of AI over the long term, and it turns out AI is likely going to be one of the most powerful tools to accelerate the time frame that that happens. So, <laughs> I got to put you in the spot, because I know you for a long time, and you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody, so I'm going to have you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Je something Jensen said, okay. which surprised us. We had this private meeting at GTC with a bunch of analysts, and he said a couple things. One, we are probably the, the, the biggest quantum computing company that doesn't make quantum computers. Yep. Okay, fair enough. And the second thing he said was, which was, we thought controversial, was pretty much everything you can do with quantum you can do with AI, with the exception of encryption. And we were like, come on. So, how do you think about that? That's what he said, I'm not putting words in his mouth. I wrote it down. Asked a bunch of people about it. <laughs> yeah, he's a smart guy, so I'm sure he had a point now, there. Now, maybe, not... maybe, he's to your point, yeah. if you can do training for a lot less money and a lot faster, that's a threat. Who knows? Yeah. But, well, I think, it, I think it is a threat. There's lots of threats to the computing architecture. We're not done with GPUs as they exist yeah, today. I mean, we're, <laughs> we got a lot of innovation going on on the semiconductor oh, yeah. side, you know, and we're just beginning that journey. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly what he meant by that. I, I I will tell you that from a pure mathematics perspective, that's not true. <laughs> you know, a qubit behaves very differently than a conventional binary bit, and and so we they give us a set of tools. Now, the argument, and we've known this for a while, is that with enough conventional computing, you can simulate a quantum system at a reasonable scale. We have quantum simulators at Dell that we built that are 30 or 40 qubits, and they behave like a quantum system with no quantum parts at all. And so if you, it may be he's looking at, hey, as the con conventional computing world, the non-QPU side continues to evolve, which it is rapidly evolving, that same computing substrate that we're going to use to make AI faster and bigger could be reapplied to essentially emulate the kind of outcomes that a quantum inspired algorithm could run on. And we have seen that. In fact, in many of the hybrid quantum classical computers, it turns out that it's not, not all the quantum inspired algorithms run on the quantum part. You actually run a lot of them in simulation on the conventional computing because it's more efficient there. And so, but there's certain things that only make sense on the QPU part, and you know, that's today. Fast forward out n number yeah, of years knows. in the future, we got a million error correcting qubits. That's a very different discussion. Can you do inferencing without GPUs? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. So that was the other thing somebody said to me that I want. I, what? When, of I, get, you can. when I get John, I I, I I I I love to stink test things that people tell me. I'm not a deep technologist. This person said, "Look, it's it's matrix math, but there's a lot of it." Yeah. And he said, "I predict going to need GPUs because there's going to be so much matrix math." How do you respond? 
Well, it depends how much inference, and clearly having an optimized engine like a, a GPU, which by the way, wasn't designed to do matrix math in, in the sense of AI, it's it's 64-bit floating point, things that aren't don't matter. Newer GPUs are more optimized, but obviously having whatever that engine is optimized to do that kind of math will give you an advantage. GPUs just happen to be that today, and that's great. That's, that's a fantastic tool, and we use a lot of it. But remember, a CPU, is an incredibly flexible system. And if you ignore raw performance, you can do anything on a GPU on a CPU, you just can't do it as fast. And it turns out in the AI world, what we realized very quickly, by the way, the next phase of AI, if you want to know what's coming next, right now we're in a phase where we're building large scale AI systems, whether they're the open AIs or whether they're an enterprise deployment, and we, so we build a big engine that is measured based on transaction rate, lots of sessions. The next phase, which we're now starting to talk about, is this concept of agents. The idea that you're not building one big monolith, you're building instances of an AI agent. You have a virtual IT ops person, a virtual marketing person, and each one is self-contained, and it turns out that you don't need massive performance, and so we use techniques like requantization to shrink the size of the model, to get them into a smaller memory footprint, to basically put them on things as small as microcontrollers, and it turns out if you don't have to move a billion transactions through it, you can still accomplish the same kind of inferencing, and the question is, which one wins at the end? The giant engine or the army that's, of agents? That's an interesting question. And I don't know, I think both play a role and I think they're both very relevant, but today we're kind of over-rotated on the first one. Well, so Cerebrus might have a play or maybe not. You know, maybe not, I don't know. I think it's going to be whoever optimizes the system and the right throughput for the compute that they need and that, exactly. that's going to be a varying... And energy plays well, exactly. into this. Exactly, no, I mean, it, it, it's, it's not, this isn't going to be one supreme leader in this case. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of different exactly. instances and inferences quite Well, explicitly. think about the AI PC. Yeah. that we introduced today. We talked about a bunch of new AI Congratulations pieces. on that, yeah, by the way. Fantastic, you know, we're in the ARM era, we're in the NPU era, fantastic. So now we have a system that's got a CPU, an NPU, and a GPU. Well, why did we do that? Why is that important? Well, it turns out that, you know, if you're running certain AI tasks, certain agents, they're not actually doing massive models and massive tasks. They require that level of But they actually have to yep. do it all the time. So like one of the really interesting use cases on AI PCs, is using the NPU for the embedded security subsystems, the monitoring of the PC. It turns out those are all AI algorithms. They're actually fairly small. When you run them in the CPU, it kind of eats up a lot of memory and it's slow. When you run Offloaded. them in the GPU, yeah. it's kind of a lot of power. You put them into the NPU and suddenly, at like 90% less power, you can run really advanced threat detection on your system and not blow up your battery. And so, so you know, there, there's examples where as we move into the AI era, right. the kind of task can be optimized for the kind of compute, and the more compute options we have available, both central and distributed, give us the ability to do this in the right way. And so the AI PC is just a platform that gives us choice to make sure we land the always on power efficient things on the right, NPU and the stuff that's the large AI processing on the GPUs and the stuff that's really tied to the operating system on the CPU and it all works on the same box, the same system. And you get a 24 hour battery life is exactly, what I heard today. Exactly. I know, it's pretty impressive. Can't I can't. So do, you, do you think AI PCs are going to shrink mm. the, 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 the life cycle? In other words, we keep our PCs forever now. Ah. We just, well, I just got this new XPS and then I see AI PCs, I want one. Well, remember, AI, <laughs> I know, I know. here's the thing that we haven't seen yet. The, the main thing that runs on an AI PC are agents. And agents, you should think of as workers in the AI world on your behalf. They do tasks for you. Uh, you know, Copilot from Microsoft is a thing that does a bunch of tasks. A security agent does security tasks. It turns out that agents are just software. And they're software and data that some of them happen to live on your PC, but funny enough, they're going to be an ensemble and they're going to speak over APIs, and they're going to work collectively together, and a whole bunch of them don't have to live on your PC. And so the life cycle of the AI PC actually is likely going to be longer than you anticipate, because even if you want to run more agents, in many cases, those agents won't run on the PC. They'll run on infrastructure, on a core somewhere, or they'll be part of your data center, or they might even be a cloud service, and it's the ensemble that actually gives you the outcome. The trick is, do you have at least some processing capability local for the things that really require privacy-preserving technology and deep confidentiality? And so the things that don't, run them somewhere else. The things that do, run them locally. And exactly. so that extends the lifespan as long as we're very smart about what actually has to be on the PC. Now, in the ideal world, every time we make that thing faster, more of those privacy-preserving, really interesting techniques can be run locally, and that creates a normal upgrade cycle. 
I told you it was awesome. I know, it, you, you weren't kidding. It's all about that hyper-customization, both for the end user as a result of AI as well as for the stack. John, thank you so much for being here. You're a wealth of information. We could have talked all afternoon. We're already over time, no but that was delicious, and we needed right. to spoon that, that all good. up. This has been absolutely fabulous. Dave, thanks for a yeah, fabulous third interview of the evening, and thank all of you for tuning in wherever you might be watching this fabulous three days of live coverage here at Dell Tech World. We're here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.